Welcome back to Insufferable Know-It-Alls. I'm your host, Jace, with my co-host is... Joey. Hey, Joey. What's up? Uh, I'm going to preface this by saying this might be the most contentious Wait, episode real quick. yet. Say preface. Preface? Thank God. You can say it right, you just choose not to. Yeah. <laughs> It's the joke. Uh, the joke is frustrating. You, know, you ruined. You ruined it. Yes, that, that was your time to laugh. But yeah, this is the most contentious episode for a number of reasons. Uh, Joey, really? would you recommend this movie? Yes, I do. But you're saying you wouldn't? I would not. Are you serious? I'm Are you serious. fucking with me? Yeah. Wait a minute. Are you fucking with me? I'm serious. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to actually even break it because I was like, I know how much this movie means to you, and I'm just like, God. Well, you've watched it before. Yeah, and, bef- and bef- no, no, bef- I, there's, I said before, when we first talked about it when you were still living up here, I said that um, I think it's shot beautifully. I think, the, I think the main actress is amazing, but that's it. I've never gone into further detail. I'm sure you would have picked up on it. Uh. Man, I want to quit the show. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I told you, this is going to be the most contentious episode. So why don't it, you go ahead? And, it shouldn't um, be contentious. Like, if you don't like it, there's nothing wrong with that. The only no, but that... the reasons why I don't, you're not, I already know. It's going to be similar to, like, the eel. Like, the, the reasons why, I guess, I, well, the difference is, is I actually really enjoyed the eel. With this one, I have different reasons why, and that's what's going to bother you. Um so from this moment forward, if you haven't seen this movie, well, those are... we'll, we'll do a quick kind of explanation. Of uh, I thought you wanted to about. wait because the explanation might include a uh, spoiler. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it clear. No, okay, I, can, go ahead. I think I can do a, a quick synopsis. I'm not going to read it off Google. <laughs> <laughs> Betty Blue follows Zorg and the titular Betty from the inception of their relationship all the way to its end. A journey that takes us through their struggle to find a place in life that isn't just a means to an end where we also experience joys sparked from such a heated romance and love. Betty discovers that Zorg has a hidden desire to be a writer, but lacks the confidence to succeed. She then provides him a platform of unconditional support, making it her goal to push him in the direction required to aspire to be something greater. All while Zorg seemingly only wants to provide some kind of stable and secure space for them in life. Uh, That's the gist of it. All right, from this moment forward, I would say spoilers. Um, we'll start off with just talking about what is great about this movie, which I know you're going to have a grocery list, so let me knock mine out first. Sad. Um, and I'm sure you're going to agree with some of the things I'm already talking about, but the shots of this movie are amazing. I really enjoy the camera movements. I enjoy the scenery. I like how they capture a lot of the atmosphere in uh, different scenes. I think it's, it's done very well in that regard. Completely. I, I really appreciate uh, the scenery that Fritz has to offer for this movie, and all the different locations have life to them. Yeah, I, I certainly love the camera work in this film. is very unique and distinct. Uh, mm-hmm. The, the I, I'll probably talk a lot about this, but the interesting thing is that there's a feeling that's evoked from watching this movie, just on a visual level. That I've tried to find elsewhere, and I, I I really haven't seen a movie that's able to match the journey that the visual journey you go through in a story like this. Like it, I just don't find anything to compare it to. I'm not talking about just the colors, but like the framing, the the the, the just the, there's a very unique quality to it that's hard to describe. But you, you there's a feeling that's evoked from the visual elements of this film that I just can't find anywhere else. And the reason why I say I'll bring this up is because I also feel the same with the type of story they're telling it is very similar, where I just can't find an experience like this anywhere else. Outside of that, like, I, I don't know if you'll disagree with this. I'll just say it because I, I'm trying to find the things that you probably couldn't argue with. Like, the music is fucking incredible. Like, uh, I, I, I listen to some <laughs> of these songs and my heart melts. Uh, I'm, I've got different feelings about it. Uh, okay, talk about it. You want to talk no, about well, it? No, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, I will say that Beatrice, say her last name, Dolly or Dalla? I think Dolly. it's just Doll. Beatrice is amazing. She's, she really does, like, phew, her, her performance in this movie is amazing. It's really, really good. 
Yeah. I, <laughs> like above, above and beyond. Like she encapsulates so many really good just moments. It, not just like happy moments, but almost the bipolar difference between the happiness and the uh, insanity. Like she, she, I feel like she captures it so well. It's nuanced like her, and natural. Yeah. It, her, her, her smiles. They're so. They're on the edge of like not yeah, knowing. Yeah, they're, they're, you can and see And then it. once you find out what happens in the end, it's like, oh, you can, you can go back and appreciate some of the moments again. Yeah, you could. And when I look at her smiles in the movie, the second time watching it, <coughs> um, which was the one where I watched it for this review, the second time watching it, I really paid attention to just like how her uh, face was expressing these emotions. And the one thing I kept seeing was there's this tinge of madness just on the edge. And you could see it if you, I think it's on purpose. I haven't seen anything else that she's been in. So. I really can't uh, attest to anything else, but I know in this movie, she nails it. So, like, I haven't seen her in anything else that I can really recall other than this one Michael Hannick film called Time of the Wolf. But I, I need to revisit that in order to kind of see see uh, what else I appreciate in her performances. But Is in this, there I, clear, I appreciate Do you think everything. there's a clear difference in her characters between both these movies? Well... Given the circumstance of the other movie, I can't really say because it's in a time of chaos. Like mm -hmm. everybody's kind of, it's like the post-apocalypse almost or, or like the transition from like normalcy to the apocalypse. So it, it's really difficult to kind of pinpoint what level of like, I don't want to say madness she might be at compared to this or something. I have seen, uh, what's his name? Uh, so uh, Zorg's character. Uh, I, I have seen John Hughes Anglad, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Anybody who speaks French is going to hate us for butchering this, and I do apologize. I know, they're going to. And, but it's also a movie that was directed by Jean-Jacques Benix. It's pretty funny. Like, I actually really liked it. Called, I think it's called Mortal... Not Mortal Coil. Mortal Trans... Uh, I've, called, I've called this character a different name, which is the poor man's Adrian Brony. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I don't think that's appropriate just by the nature of, like, this is way way ahead of... His time, like Jesus. Yeah, I know. It's just what and because he's way of the more order. handsome than Adrian Brody. Um, I mean, they look so similar to me. It, it's crazy. But uh, keep keep going though. Let's talk about other things that you loved about this movie. The, the I I know how you kind of want to format this. I just don't think it's well. I'm saying it. I'm saying it this way because I know there's more you want to talk about that you love. But that can come up through the the things that we we both disagree. So, for instance, you you want to talk about me to talk about why the music's great and then i'm gonna have to defend it which then will just go back to me talking about how the music's great like uh, that's I mean, why there's a redundancy to it that i don't know if it's if, if it's the best approach okay well uh, i could say this like i there i do not like the circus music like at all and it's throughout the movie i keep hearing it and because that particular rendition is only played once or twice in the movie but the melody itself is played in a subtle and intense ways throughout uh, it's i just think it's an interesting execution of the of a theme combined with what music albeit maybe antiquated for something in the mid 80s in france i don't know but it's something that would be heard at a carnival at least that's what the composer was saying in an interview that that the sound derived from his memory of something like that I mean, it just, it took me out of the experience, that's why. Like, I just, I felt like there was moments like that where I, I was like, I, I think that at least, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but my interpretation of it is that it's supposed to, it's supposed to illustrate the craziness that is her. And it's that circus kind of insanity. If the question is about how odd the music sounds to us, then no. I think it was motivated by something that would have played at a carnival in days past. That being said, they may have chosen it knowing that a majority of people, such as us, would interpret it to be unsettling, but I think those are two different things. I, I think a part of the reason you may be put off by it may also be lent to something that's simply lost in translation, because we have no reference for what music is appropriate at a carnival in France prior to the 1980s. But we didn't take that class in high school, sadly. I don't know. I, I'm not... I, I, I don't see how it took you out of the experience, but I also don't fault you for being put off by something so off-putting either. And your interpretation could be right, too. I, I, I don't know. 
Which, if that if that was the intention, I'm fine with it. But I don't think that's the intention for what you're describing. You said it's based based on what is around these areas. So yeah, I don't. So if that's the case, again, I I can't give it credit that it's it's making me uh, feel that way. I, that's just something. No, I but bring I, into what I'm it. saying is like it's it's not at anyone's fault. Like you, nobody can fault you for not knowing. Same with me. Like when I first watched it, I was like, mm-hmm. that's creepy and disturbing. I like it for that reason. But if that was the intention, I would like it more. I I don't know. You're so fucking frustrating. I almost blackballed. We we have this thing for our our audience where if there's a movie that we have a very specific reason not to watch it or not to review it, we call it the blackball. And we only do it once per season of our show. And I almost and I had to do it because this. you wanted you just were adamant about watching Battlefield Earth. Oh, I really, and I just, it's Joey, it's the first step into our indoctrination. Uh-huh. We have to. It's weird really weird and on the nose <laughs> that they call it that. <laughs> um but uh the reason why I wanted a black ball it actually had nothing to do with my my thoughts on if this is a good or a bad movie. Th- this movie there's a very personal thing that I connect with in this movie and it is j- it's specifically for my past what I I've, I've been through. And yeah, and I love even, having to force you to relive trauma. So no, it it really it really was <laughs> like even rewatching it. It's there's a traumatic experience that I I take away from this because I'm going to get personal with this episode. Uh, I fine. actually had to really think about it. Our last few days where we were considering when we were recording, I kept rewriting things of uh, uh, intros of ways to talk about this movie, of how to breach the subject that I don't like this movie. Because there's two different ways I could I could look at this movie, which is the personal uh, thing, which again I can't control that, but I could separate that. And as a separate, you know, thing, it's just a movie experience. I didn't enjoy it as much. I, I felt like even, I guess I've always watched the director's cut version. Maybe I would appreciate the shorter version more. On a on the personal side of it, this is a story about a very very insane relationship that something very similar that I've been through where I dated and was in a very long relationship with somebody that had a lot of these tendencies. And I don't know, there's a lot of uh, personal feelings it gives me. The first time I watched it, I was like, this is back when you were up here. I had to take like a few days just to myself. But that and wasn't I think the first it was time you watched time. it, was it? Because I, 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 like, I, I guess we can get into our first experiences with this at some point. Mm-hmm. But this this wasn't the first, or this this is probably the third time you watched it, though. Correct? No, this is the second time. The first time I watched it was when you told me about it once you moved up here, because I knew about it, but I hadn't had a chance to watch it yet. Oh, okay. When you first moved up here, I finally was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch this movie now because I've seen scenes of it and I've seen things of that before, but I was really like, okay, I'm gonna dive into this. And the, my takeaway was you, and this, even this time watching it, it cements my thoughts that you are very forgiving of foreign films. Mm, I, I don't think that's fair. I, I mean, it's just my, per, again, it may not be true. It's just how I, how I've taken it from the last, the last few films that you've like really enjoyed. Or it could just be a matter of taste. Like I it have could be. different I'm not, I'm not going to and... say you're wrong. Um, it's. It, I just think that when it comes to a lot of the foreign films, like you, you do give it a higher appreciation. You might have that line of thinking because I don't tell you about the bad ones. You know, I only tell you about the ones that I like. But the but ones that do, I don't but like, do you might. We do talk about bad ones. We talk but, about bad mm, movies all the time. <laughs> not, not to the same extent because I, I usually, even though it seems, especially based off of how the episodes we picked, we watch very kind of critically acclaimed movies to an extent, not the ritual and legend aside, where, and Silent Hill, fuck, never mind. Like, okay, maybe no, we don't. Maybe that. we, we watch garbage. <laughs> we, <don't. laughs> we watch everything. Yeah, so, but I, I, I don't want to kind of get too sidetracked, but I, I do watch more Western films than I do foreign films still. But not by the, like, the nature of, of my interest necessarily, but the bad foreign films that I watch are... Few and far between, but I think it's also the nature of we we've talked about this recently, where I think that there's just a different 
type of film being designed and developed and stories being told elsewhere because they have to do something different to stand out. They, they can't just walk the line of normalcy and expectation of what a Western audience has because they, they're forced to do something different to stand out. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like that that's why there might be a part of me that attracted to more foreign films than I am Western films because I do see them trying different things. And that's at least where I'm at in my life. That's what interests me. When, when mm-hmm. an artist can do something that provokes me in a way that I didn't expect or anticipate and they're able to kind of be two steps ahead of me, that's rare. And I love that. Not to say that I'm a fucking brilliant genius, but it's hard to find something that and I actually wrote a note for this regarding this film that I, I'm not walking in two steps in front of. But that being said, I, I do want to just don't want to like walk over the music because there's more than just the carnival song. Like that, you, that, the, that's the bigger that's the biggest thing that detracts me from the movie. But there is other music in it like that I enjoyed. I enjoyed the saxophone. I, I enjoyed. Oh yeah, the saxophone. Uh, but the 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 song that has this motif throughout the entire thing. When when they're in the, they go to Eddie's mother's place where she just passed away, and he goes downstairs. That scene almost brings me to tears for some reason. That that's like that good. Uh, uh, the piano, just... the piano's great. Uh, the only the only thing that took me out of this movie is the circus music. Like everything else, I, I was fine with. That's why I, I didn't want to say nay exactly earlier when you talked about it. I, I would recommend listening. Like, I, well, you probably don't care. And it's probably not the easiest thing to access since it's on the Criterion. It might be on YouTube or something. I don't know. But I recommend listening to the uh, supplemental material because it actually, it just it's just fun to kind of go back and understanding like like why this was interesting to them mm-hmm. in the first place and the thoughts behind it. Or at least it's something that's always compelled me because like the the making of things inspire me because I'm trying to make stuff. Mm-hmm. So watching, especially for a film that I really love and appreciate, and, and going back and seeing like why they made certain decisions, it, it, it motivates me. When, where were you when you first watched this movie? So I had first heard about this movie fucking, like, god damn, maybe 2011. Uh, and I, me and Jason, obviously based off the first episode, should have kind of tipped the hat that we are huge Silent Hill fans. <laughs> uh, and there, the games, not the movies. There's a special Silent Hill making of that kind of t- touches on this movie, but also the the second game specifically. And there's uh, a book that came out in Japan that talks about some of the things that inspired them when creating the series, not just specifically the second game, but like also the first and third, and even the fourth, where this was brought up. And specifically, this movie with the director's cut. So I, I it wasn't easy to find, um, but I was able to find it, and it was the perfect inspiration for the film that I was trying to make at the time. Which that's a fucking story unto itself. What's the name uh, of that? What's I don't want to talk film? about it. <laughs> just say it. Just say it real fast. <laughs> Whatever. But the the I watched it, and I don't know if I necessarily fell in love with it right away. But I, I, I really, really enjoyed it. The second time I watched it is when I fell in love with it, which was probably some years later. And from that point on, it's kind of been a movie that I'll watch for inspiration. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this, I'm sure, maybe even now, but with regards to how in maybe the third viewing that I, I kind of connected to the creative side of this film, where it's, it does touch on like the creative process, I, I think. That was one of the intentions of the uh, film was to kind of have a character who struggles through the creative process. There, there's actually an, an I think an intentional in, interpretation you can have where a lot of this revolves around the idea of a muse, and, and maybe even some of it has like kind of more dream qualities where maybe it is all an allegory or a metaphor. But that the ever since then. It's hard to deny this feeling of like the what I maybe it's where I'm at in my life. I just my heart melts anytime I see Betty support like the efforts of somebody who who doesn't nec- who wants to try something different and doesn't know if they can believe in themselves. And having somebody else there to believe in you is fucking beautiful. And it's required, I think, 
to push somebody in a direction where they feel like they can try to do something different in their life. And that's a big part of my experience with watching this now, even outside of the romantic elements of it. That is part of the romance, in my opinion. You're not going to like some of the negative reviews that I had pulled for that. Because... I was, yeah, like I, I have, like, I, and I have, like, no joke, dude, bro. Uh, <laughs> 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 the, I have probably like a fucking 15 minute rant I can go on. I, I know, but there, there's, that, there's that one. That touches in... on what you're, you're, you'll describe. <laughs> there's one in particular I want to read just to that point you just. Oh, uh, you just... Like, you want to read it now? <laughs> Well, only only because of what you just brought up with the inspiration behind uh, people and what they're doing and, and her inspiration for the main character. But um, it's from Peter Kyo, <laughs> K-E-O-U-G-H. Uh, it's uh, from the Chicago Reader, and his um, actual review, a uh, short review was, perhaps what is least satisfying about Bernays' effort is its implied theme Benets. that... Women are mere muses to be added, suffocated, and sacrificed to revitalize the imaginations of men. Mm. I don't think that's. I don't think. I think that speaks more to the the critic than than the actual piece itself. I don't think it's a fair review. Um, I, I because I don't I don't necessarily agree with what he's getting at. I see the point he's trying to push, but I don't think that's that's the intention of the movie. But but when it came to me, my first time watching this, and this is where I'll jump into the personal story, is that um, I had a. a oh, pre- so you're getting personal. I gotta go, man. I know. Yeah, I'm sorry. I gotta go. I can't. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad you were able to listen to me and what I had to say, but I gotta go. <laughs> um, back when I was barely early twenties, Jace, uh, the you know bushy eye, uh, or <laughs> big bright yeah, eyes, bushy- big bushy eyes. <laughs> <laughs> bushy tailed big bright eyed jace uh i had a relationship with uh somebody that had a very um a very dark mental uh struggle with depression and anger and it eventually ended to when um well she died because well, also of well i i don't want to speak for you and like you can edit this part out but clearly you have your your mother <laughs> Yeah, and, and my mom too. too <laughs> and, and, the... and my mom is my. The thing is, is that my um, my she was my fiance at the time. Uh, she had a very a very severe depression uh, issue that she had been struggling with for a while. And I grew up with my mom, who has a very extreme anger condition. And there was times where she would do stuff that she wouldn't realize she's doing, and then afterwards she would forget that she did them. So there is there's a lot of that in my life that I had faced. So watching this movie, I know you you took a very very strong romantic feeling from it. What I found was that people that romanticize these kinds of relationships are not like they're not looking at the reality of it, which is like these relationships are toxic, they're dangerous. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but I you are <laughs> I agree with what you're saying, and we can talk about that. Mm-hmm. Because like the the I don't deny one bit that what what I love about this film is I feel like maybe you felt like the intention was to overlook that I think it shines a great light on it because it's just a part of all of us to be inherently selfish and, and just be unaware and want to deny the things that will upset us in life and just act like everything could be normal if we just kind of like move on move past it she's not crazy like oh you just need more things right or, or we just let's move somewhere else and that yeah and, and, and you're not wrong i think it's on purpose it, it, the idea though is that it does romanticize a lot of the themes of that and it's like for me the personal just this is not based on me attacking the movie uh for its credibility this is me just really venting about how it made me feel when i first watched it which that volatile nature between both of them was something that I've lived through with me and my, you know, ex fiance. We we had went from a very, very rough time getting together to having to move out because her parents wouldn't accept it, to living in the most poor, crappy part of town just so we could survive. And even then just dealing with all that, and even when it was the best times, there was these moments where it was like we're the things are good right now these are the good times and i'm frantically crying and just you know holding myself because i don't know what to do to help fix anything and it's something that this movie 
Echo basically pulled out of me. And not just the first time I watch it, even the second time, there's a nervous energy that starts to spark up in me and it makes me uncomfortable. Um, not because of uh, the movie's intention to do that. It's more just because it's like the reflection I have when I watch it. It's like I said, the, the dangerous of the dangers of this kind of relationship are something that has an adult version of Jace that's not bright eyed and bushy tailed. I this this is the tell, telltale signs of getting away from these kinds of people because it never ends well. It always will be a toxic or dangerous time. I, I there's a moment that I, I kind of pinpoint and like, because I, I felt this before, but I think this kind of confirmed it for me where it kind of speaks to that with something that's just a look. It, it, and it's the part where he finds her, I, I guess for those, well, we'll probably spoil it, but I'll, I'll finish. We've already, we've quick. already spoiled it. <laughs> so the, there's a part where she kidnaps a kid and takes him to like a, a toy store, basically. And he finds her and like they have to run away because the mother's looking for the kid or something. And there's a part in the street where, and you, this kind of spoke to this earlier about her performance, where the manic uh, emotions that she experiences in that specific moment while they're running away in slow motion, you see her turn to like concern, to smiling, to kind of like just weird excitement. And you see Zorg, who's just very concerned and upset and then he turns just for a moment and sees her smile and he tries to smile and then it turns back to concern and i mm -hmm. think all that was intentional oh yeah no all that is intentional those those small things i really appreciate on the movie this is what i didn't like about the movie this is me separating myself from my personal experience and just watching it as a movie experience and that uh while i'm watching this passionate slash um <laughs> crazy relationship they're not it's the volatile nature of what they're going through and what they're you know the highs and lows of that is constantly at least in my opinion being conflicted with the jovial nature of some of the other scenes in the movie and the hu like this humorous scenes that are just feeling like they're over the top the whole bank high scene i just didn't feel like it was necessary who in the hell reads porn out loud i the, i have what i my rant has <laughs> kind of touches on that and and I think it has to do with the sensibility that's the one thing that I, I it's not just with this movie this is what cuts back to something we we've talked about earlier with other movies that you appreciate with Unagi which, I know you're gonna like specifically say Unagi I, I, I am <laughs> and, but the difference is is that at least at that one I didn't feel like it was while it was still conflicting with the themes in the movie it didn't detract it for me it's just a different movie than what I was expecting I don't think the eel's a bad movie it's just not what I was walking and expecting for this movie, these humorous scenes that like, I'm not talking about the small scenes where him and, uh, is it Eddie? Uh, him and Eddie are like laughing or they're showing their, you know, uh, joyous nature around each other. I'm talking about the scenes like in the bank heist where it's like, this is, it feels like I'm watching a national lampoon scene. Speaking to like what the, the director was talking about, and and it's what I kind of felt too was the absurdity is intentional. I, I'm like sure we're, we're watching something that's somewhat. Uh, it's not surreal, but it's kind of hyper realistic in, in a way that goes along the lines of I like the the. Like I have a lot of things to say that speak to a lot of this, and I don't know if I really just want to put it all on these like fine points because. But the but this I like is to be more just... specific. But I, I feel like if I just say it all, like it, it'll all kind of connect for at least my perspective. And, and I feel like ultimately we'll also just come to terms with like there, there's it's not a factor of failing to execute. It, it's just a matter of like what we appreciate in, in our expectations. Yeah, I, I would say and that there's hyper realism, that. but the hyper realism you're talking about, like I said, that's it is their relationship is. For me, like I've seen these, it's not just in my personal relationship and other relationships. I, this is a very realistic depiction of mental illness. Yeah, and, and like I think when I say like the way that I worded it when I was thinking about it was like it's like a gentle dramatic lens, where <laughs> where it's like you, you open up in this movie and they're having such intense lovemaking, and 
I guess that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> where like it's it's real it can be yeah. it's something no, that's it's achievable all that, so but all that is that's real. where the gentleness comes from and then the the but the dramatic elements come from the absurdity but like, see i could do without the absurdity and still get everything you're talking about the absurd moments in this movie like there's not a lot but the ones that are like the dealing with some of the cops and their antics like it's so over the top humorous where it's like it, it to me it completely detracted the feeling that this movie was giving me and I was like, fuck, I don't know why they did that. Like, it's not, I don't think it's good when they do that. That's why I can't give this movie a pass. It's weird because like you're, you're talking about the things that I, I can like in this oh, movie. Oh, I know. It's the and same that's... thing with the eel with you too. Whenever <laughs> yeah. we talked about that, it's like those over the top humorous moments you love. I, I'm letting myself in this world where, where like the moment where he's sitting down with the, the garbage men, uh, and he's just like patting him on the knee as they're watching this guy kind of vent his frustrations on this mattress. That took his and, hand. And, <laughs> and, and the thing, <laughs> wait, real quick, let me finish. Uh -huh. You have something that arguably from a realistic point of view, you just go upstairs and like avoid it all. But it, this character's participating in this moment. And like he's allowing this sentimentality to kind of exist. And, and that's what I see is also happening with the absurdity. So with these over-the-top moments where the guy's jumping out and pointing his gun at him, it's all a part of that same thing. And I, I don't know if I can necessarily define it, and I don't know if I, I've said this before, there's some things that I'd rather leave undefined and just to the sake of, like, a feeling because it's more powerful that way. That's what art is. It's like you don't want to define these things in very specific confines, so you create something, an experience that can speak to it. Well, there's a French word for it. Is it the avant-garde? Uh, I don't want to admit how stupid I am. I have no clue. I think that's it. Uh, uh, but it's it's basically art that's not supposed to be. Um, it's intentionally left for your imagination to run with it, not to be defined. But with this, like I said, those those absurd moments. If you took those out of the movie, I think I would have enjoyed this movie so much more. Like I, those. I, I don't. It would be a different movie that I would also probably appreciate. I, I just don't know if it would, I would have the same. It would, would be such a different experience that it would be something that I don't know if I can necessarily say I would like or dislike. You like know? I said, it's just, it just to me, the, there is a realistic depiction of mental illness. of And it, what's funny is like their relationship is depicted how what a real relationship is in this kind of situation with her and him both. The highs and the lows. The, high, the heightened sexuality moments the heightened joyous moments the time when they're sitting out there at the, uh, uh, the at the sunset together I, mixed I with like go ahead zorg as a character is the the every man that's looking for what his ideal romance is sure. but just somebody who's completely unequipped to deal with the reality of relationships that that have these traumas attached to it like you you see somebody who makes decisions that are based off of pure emotion. And even though I disagree with a lot of his actions, like I'm there and I can still care and empathize with his decisions because they come from a I'm place of- I'm not saying any of the, his, like his decisions are how I was when I was 20 years old and madly in love. And you couldn't tell me how crazy I was, the stuff I was doing was because the stuff I was doing was crazy. And it was for this chemical in your brain that says do it because it makes this this feel so correct and right i think all that's fine the loon the adding the adding the looney tune-esque uh scenes in this just takes away that experience for me it's like well to, are the, what i don't know like there's there's a lot of that in this movie that to me i just i even the first time i watched it i was just like what is going on? Like we're we're in the middle of something else, and they're doing this. There's no reason for it. Same thing with, uh, whenever they encounter the um policeman, or whenever they encounter um, oh, they're uh, the a uh, garbage man, and it's just like th this scene doesn't add anything to this. It doesn't tell me anything that I, that's not taking me out of this, the themes that the movie's been portraying, and it's not a short movie. This, yeah. or at least, I guess the direct, the regular version might be shorter, but this movie is long, and we go on a journey, and I'm going to go over it real fast. We go on a journey from them at a beach, where they're both basically just making their way through life, living on this little cottage on the side of a beach, painting houses, to 
uh, downtown Paris, was it, or outside Paris? I don't uh, know the specific location, but it was just like a small kind of a bed and breakfast. It, yeah, to uh, finally, to moving into a piano house. to And it's like each place they go to, it has these moments where they're like, you can't, no matter what you go, no matter what you try to do, she still has these mental issues. And all that I thought was so good and so compelling. But then when you riddle it with these other seeds, it's just, it takes it away from me so much because it, it's almost making light. You, and th- Go ahead. I agree that there is an honesty in the portrayalment of these characters, as you said. But like I tried to explain earlier, probably poorly, it shines through a gentle dramatic lens where it's not necessarily grounded in the way, let's say, like a, a Michael Hannock film could be. But it's not entirely absurd either. Like, for me, it's a compelling balance, like watching a tightrope walker sway back and forth as he moves from one end to the other. And that swaying represents moving into reality and then going back into dreaminess. And then moving into reality and then going into this dreaminess where where I think that's where the absurd that people are calling... I, I liken it to this combination of this dreamy reality and i think the director does a fantastic job at balancing this the execution's great on my end very similar to how i think imamura executed unagi these moments help me be closer to zorg and betty and there may be parts of the film that seem unnecessary to the story's progression certainly why there's an hour difference between the theatrical cut and the director's cut but i welcome these scenes I mean, I love the progression of these characters and their development seems to justify the three-hour runtime to me. Because of it, I felt like I was with these characters in a figurative sense, you know? Like, you don't want to be behind your characters because you might get lost. You don't want to be in front of them either because then there's no surprises or nothing to look forward to. But with this, I felt like I was with them. It's rare because I feel like it's a pacing that usually accommodates a TV show or maybe a series of movies. And I welcome it. A- an example scene would be like when Zorg is with Eddie at his restaurant and they kind of are bamboozling that salesman. That leads into their return home to discover that Betty's been arrested. And it doesn't seem out of place to me. The, the uh, chronology of these scenes seem fitting. It doesn't disinterest me because I can see how it relates to moments in life that are stranger than fiction. And it enhances the disappointment Zork faces given the circumstances leading up to it, where he's experiencing the absurd, to then be brought down into reality. I'm not saying it's for everyone. It clearly isn't. But personally, I can dive into these worlds without being distracted by how a quote-unquote absurd it might be. And I can just let the dreaminess in. Oh, I I know what you're saying. The difference is, here's a a better way, here's a better example I, I could give you. All right? When you watch Twin Peaks, and we follow, what is the tall cop's name in it? I forgot his name. Andy? Andy. When you watch Andy's antics in Twin Peaks, where he literally steps on a rake and it hits him in the head, and he does it again and again and again, to you, those moments might be interesting and good. To me, those moments take away from the overall plot of Twin Peaks. It, it's just, it's all, there's nothing wrong with it. You know no, what I mean? But it's for, like, but it's just for me, all there is. Case. But <laughs> right. I'm but saying that... what I mean by there's nothing wrong with it is specifically like me and you have different ideas of the experience we desire. Sure. And this movie hits it. And, and for you, you would like a different film. Right. But that's and, what I'm saying. In Twin Peaks, do you appreciate those scenes as well, as much? Yeah. All I, of I've them? Never, <laughs> I, like, it depends on what you're talking about. Because there's a point where the it kind of gets far away from... Where the moment, I mean, Twin Peaks is an entirely different conversation, I but know, the second but... <laughs> they start adding characters that seem to only distract from the characters that you've already fallen in love with is or, where I fall Or apart. how about, how about Nadine losing her mind and going back to high school and being a high school student again and getting super strength? Is that, is that adding to the overall story? It, well, like, it's, I feel like it's a different conversation because I don't think that there's parts that were intended to be a part of it, but... That show fell apart, obviously, after yeah. the the second or during the second season when that. But happened. that's how that level of disassociation from the main story is how I felt with this movie and those seeds that this movie is the, offering is the, the same thing for me. But no, there's a difference though because I think Twin Peaks strays away from the intention of the creator, where I think this doesn't. 
But like, even the beginning, that's where my Twin... distaste from the Twin Peaks stuff comes in. But, but even let's in the say beginning... anything in the first season. That's yeah, like okay, weird and even, absurd. even in the beginning of the first season, Andy's still doing really weird things that you go, you can find endearing, and I find frustrating. Yeah, it, that's and that's just going to be. A, that, uh, but right, but that's that's the correlation I'm making between that and this. Like these scenes of this movie, we already have a realistic depiction of this. If you show a really weird, surreal, dreamlike, you know, scenes with these very comical moments that are straight out of Looney Tunes almost. I almost, I swear to God, whenever they had the cop and they had the piano in the back of the uh, logging truck, I thought yeah, when he's gonna... walking away, like I laughed. Like every time I watch that, like I'm smiling and I Ugh. feel happy. Like yeah, I, I, it doesn't take away anything for me. It takes, it takes so much away. And it's, it's for me, I just, I would have rather watched a movie that didn't have these scenes to detract me from the overall story. And I thought that again, this is my personal atten- or my personal thoughts about the movie was the intention was this is not love, this is borderline lust and fantasy. This is two people that have two different things going for them. One of them is their mental condition, and the other one keeps gravitating towards her because at the beginning of the movie, he d- he seems almost kind of disinterested in in actually pursuing something until she pushes for it. Mm, I don't see that. Uh, yeah, again, different opinions. I, I, um, I, I think me and you can have an understanding, but also differing opinions of what you you would specifically define love as. Yeah, definitely. Like in hindsight, you could always say it was lust, but in the moment, you would never define it as that. Probably and not. And I feel like this character was in love. They loved each other. I don't I think, think that... he, he would act as... Like we can, oh, I guess we haven't spoiled it really yet. Like at the very end of the movie, she she kind of goes into a catatonic let me, state. Let me do this for you. Uh, at the, it, towards the end of the movie, it starts to go up at a very high incline of happiness because she thinks she's pregnant, and she takes a pregnancy test. It says she is. They start to get it looks like a, a what a happy family would develop into, and then when she finds out it's a it was a, a false positive, so a negative pregnancy. Uh, when she got, gets it done again, she loses it, chops her hair off, um, goes into these really weird moments of, I don't know what to really call it, not exactly catatonic, but just moments of, of complete and total disillusionment. Um, and then after that, there's a scene where he comes home to what is basically a bloodbath. She, gouges her, she gouged her eyes out and was rushed to the hospital. Yeah, what, what, sorry. One eye. Uh, and then when he gets there uh, and sees that she's catatonic, the doctors tell him, hey, look, the she's mentally insane. Like, she needs medication. She needs therapy. She needs, uh, they even consider electroshock. And he basically loses it, too. He sneaks back in at the end of the night to tell her goodbye, smothering her with a pillow. But that's uh, the direction the movie takes you, where it's, he's justifying what he's doing because she's, in this catatonic state, I don't feel like it's justified. I feel like, regardless what he's doing, I don't think is a mercy. I think the oh, biggest, no. I think yeah, the biggest like, thing is he's doing it. He's doing this because, out of his selfish. own, yeah, his own selfish, like yeah. you know, things. But which it, and it's selfishness coming from a place of like, the the way that the director described it was like it's the way that a horse r- jumps over like a jutted rock and, and like cuts the back of his leg to the yeah, point where I, he's I, dying. I, I, yeah, I read that. And, and the merciness of it, while me and you, like I think we both agree on the fact that it, it comes from a place of selfishness, it is something that he can't cope with the loss of not having what he's loved. So he does something incredibly selfish. And, and I say this because also you see Betty trying to struggle. And that's something that I love about this is the tragedy there is you see somebody killing somebody because they can never be the same again. And you see the, the willingness of survival showing that like, this isn't somebody who wanted this. Like this wasn't for her. Yeah. It's, it's her, her death in that scene is definitely from him doing something selfishly. And there's a resilience of life and a struggle to survive that she is expressing. But it is from that moment of you'll never you will be the same. So I'm going to end it because you 
we're only happy when we are at our most craziness. No, I don't. I don't see it like that. I, I see, do because I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think he's ever desired because you he's seen nothing but frustration in him, like somebody who has to juggle this relationship. Yeah, but keep but in it, mind, I, it's the idea that you're if you have to pick between this amazing loving intensity, but with it comes the level of craziness. Is the craziness worth it? And for him, he justifies the craziness all the way up until the end, in which a doctor actually tells him. I'm a doctor. She is crazy. And even then, he still cannot accept it. And yeah. it's like, you, you could still have her. You could still, y'all could still be together. It's just going to be such a giant change because she needs to be medicated. She needs therapy. And because the things will change, he flat out refuses to let them by just ending it. And I think it's the impatience of youth and even like youth. I think he's actually supposed to be either in his late 20s 30s maybe, he's maybe, early like he says at the beginning I think of the he's movie, 30 years old yeah if i remember correctly maybe. at the beginning of the movie he says like when you get to 30 you have you start to realize things about life for the first time fuck that is true it's weird <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's i, I and it, this is not a right or wrong scenario it, it's more oh yeah like, i'm I, not I, this what's funny is what i just described is not i don't think that's what makes that's something that makes this movie bad i i like it i think that i think this is really a credit to the rest of the movie is this finale uh points it really does just hit the nails on the head when it comes to the the uh, craziness of her and him and their relationship i think it's good but it's can, um like i don't want to like can you I, I didn't. I said it because I wanted to make my piece. But do you, do you think that you could have a movie like this anymore? Yeah, definitely. Like I said, the one. I don't. But where uh, is it at? <coughs> Shutter Shutter Island. No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, like with the, these types of this, the the romance of it. Yeah, you like could. This, you could de- what's Shutter the- Island is the the. Dr- I only feel dread in that movie. This movie makes me feel light and. Uh, no, there there's a movie. Oh, whoa, man! It's gonna hang on one sec. Let me. Look this up. Uh, 2007 movie called Crazy Love. No, that's not it. Sorry, <laughs> God, wrong I'm one. You in the fucking throat. You serious? <laughs> Jesus Christ. There, there is, there is plenty of movie. I'm not allowed to be free. Shut the fuck up, Siri. <laughs> uh, but the, no, there, there is, there is definitely movies I've seen that do, that do portray the both sides of this. It just the, needs to be shorter. <laughs> no, but that's that's what I'm saying though. Like I I know you don't like the length, but I like the length because it helps me take me on this journey with this character. And, and I can't find a a show or a movie that makes me feel like this from like the in, the, the inception of like they were fucking for weeks or for a week, and then their their lives joined together, and then from there on we see this love blossom, and then I, even outside of like the tragic ending. Like it's just hard to find something lit. I feel like the only the closest thing, if I had a gun to my head and had to say it, was like the first three seasons in Downton Abbey, might have been the closest thing that touched on <clears throat> this mean, type there, of relationship. I, I do feel like the, the the I've seen movies like this that do do exactly what you're describing, but I don't know if you're gonna give them the same level of credit that you'll give this movie. No, it's not credit. It's a feeling. Like this movie has a feeling attached to it. I can't find anywhere else. Maybe it's in your mind. That's a fucking most stupid and redundant. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's in my mind. I'm mm-hmm. the one that said it. That's right. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think you're, I, again, I, I think that if you free your imagination more, you would probably find more movies that could no, have the same effect on you. It's, I, I think you're, you're misguided in thinking it's about me freeing my imagination. It's just like saying, like, the, here's the color blue, it, it, even though it's really purple. Well, just free your imagination and think it's blue. No, it's fucking purple. That's all the spectrum like, of blue. But you you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, like, you I just get can't it. force a movie to be that way by. No, yeah, definitely. Here's that the thing: way. that not every movie's. Well, I mean, look back at the, at your last few picks that you you chose to watch. How many movies of any of these are there out there? How many shames are there? Well, How many? That's, that's what I was saying, though. Is like I think you can <clears throat> still make a shame. But I don't think you can make something like this. I, 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 not just because I don't see it. It's, I think it has to do with the 80s was a time when you could have this level of sincerity. But when it comes to this movie, 
if you take out all the absurd moments, I feel like you have a better movie. For me. Um, for you, not so much. But if yeah. you took all those uh, elements that you find endearing about this, like the the jokey moments, the straight sketchy moments out, I feel like you thought you would find more movies like it out there because I know I've seen them. Uh, this is just like I said for on the personal level, this movie it hits me too hard in the feels, and every time I watch it, it like it makes me break down a bit. And even this last Ooh, time I'm I watched break it, you down, bitch. Even though even this last time I watched it. I was like, it, it still put me in a really bad place. And it's like, man, this is, it's good that it had that effect on me. But I, I, I know. I want to say ahead. something because I, I, I wanted to say this earlier, but I forgot and I don't want to forget it. Where I, what I love watching this a second time, it's like watching Fight Club for the second time, you know? And even though I've seen this multiple times, but it's this idea like you can go back and you can see things that you didn't recognize were there before. That, that kind of reference, the, the collapse of her mental state. And there, I've seen comments about how it it's, seems to play it up for, for the humor. It, like, for instance, the beginning when she's throwing all the pots and pans out. Like, from, my, from the character's perspective, like, we're both seeing the same thing. Like, we're not aware of her mental state. We just see somebody acting out the way that we would attach anybody acting that way. No, not to I would say wouldn't. that everybody see, that acts I, out I is would crazy. completely disagree with you there. Whenever I watch this movie, the very first time when she was throwing everything out, I immediately thought about some of my worst moments in, in bad relationships. But where what I was I'm like, saying this is, is you, hang on, you... let me finish my thought. Um, no, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that is that those moments in the beginning of the movie. All I thought was, oh, time to leave. Like, this is not a good, this isn't a good relationship. This, there's nowhere you could go from here because she's not looking at what her actions and the ramifications of what they're doing. Which, it, when my first time watching it, what she had the lantern in her hand, I was like, oh no, <laughs> she's going to burn it down. And when she does, it's like, yeah, no, this cements it. Get away from but her. But you, your, your comment is ignoring the fact that I just said that you have a character that doesn't know. He like should. The, he's from his perspective, <laughs> but you're talk. That's coming from somebody who's ex personally experienced. No, even himself. even even back. Even I'm not talking about per, from my personal experience as a 20s. I'm the, talking about as a 30 year old no, man. No, but here's the thing. We've had these conversations before. The one that I always look back to is when I was writing Come Home, and you and everybody else was saying like, "Well, you can't have a character who loves and hates his wife. Why doesn't he just leave him? Why doesn't she just leave him then, or whatever?" But I think I it was, was more in a relationship. You're writing. I was in a relationship like that, and they do exist. No, you, they, even in a place they, where you can be thing. conscious or aware it's, of these concerns, I've personally been in moments in my 30s I know, where but that's I've not experienced a, that chaos, that's not and a I good didn't thing. leave. But you should have. <laughs> and you I should know. I'm in a happy relationship because I persevered. <laughs> I don't, Me and my again, wife are fine. Again, I don't, I don't see it that way. And not, not commenting on you. I'm talking about when you were writing Come Home, you still left. Like, it's like those relationships exist and they exist to teach us that, hey, there's better ones out there. But that's coming. There's a character trait that Zorg has that isn't saying that it's appropriate, but it's just a personality that isn't attaching it to psychosis, I mean. But eventually, even when he's faced with it, he still rejects it. So maybe he knew it the whole time. No, what I see, and this is why I love the length, is because you start to piece together and then also recognize the hidden moments that she plays that reveal this, where more and more through repetition, you can attach this to this idea that he wants to not believe in. He doesn't want to think is true. Yeah. I, in the beginning of the relation, I don't see that at all. I don't think that he would attach that right away to that because this is their first interaction together where she does something like that. And it for him and the state of mind that he's in, his care for her is overwhelmed by her behavior where like i love her even though she's acting like a weird crazy person right now i can look past it and we can still try to make things work out that's it, what uh, i see to a fault to a point where he eventually does quote unquote mercy kill her like i think no, that this is the beginning more though more crazy you, you go more you, there's around. an entire journey no, no, that I, happens I, from point a to point stick b stick with me <clears throat> stick with me in the beginning of the movie, he's excusing her behavior. As the movie progresses, he continues to excuse it, even though he knows something's wrong. I think excusing and then <laughs> denying. 
Not, De- both, denial. Uh, both. I think it's both. Uh, because even when he's talking to Eddie about it, he know he's saying it's like no, we just need to be left alone right now. I need to calm her down. Uh, and all I thought was like he's okay. He he knows he's aware of this. He he knows she does fits like this. He's excusing them, and then when people f- say, "Hey, I think she's crazy," he flat out denies it, even to the point where it's like you're not you're doing something to yourself. You're and that, lo- but th- this is a flawed character, though. That's what I love about it. it it's real. I think. You, you, I think you're, you're painting yourself to be the perfect, the perfection of like, these things are stupid because I would oh, never I do that. And no, no, I no, no. I'm not the saying they're, right away. I'm not saying they're stupid. I'm saying that this is something that should be, sca- this is something that should be looked at as a, um, uh, what you call it? A, um, <coughs> a cautionary tale. Like these are moments where it's like, this is what you don't, you need to get away from because this th- these things don't end well they never do like yeah, this and, is and I've, but i've said this earlier in the conversation like you have a character who doesn't have the toolbox required to address these things and, and I, what i love is the honesty and the decisions he makes is from somebody who doesn't understand what the best thing to do is if like he was his younger, decision to think like m- getting money is the thing that's going to fix it all if that, he was that's so honest and true to like listen, what I think I would have thought in the past. Yeah, if you were younger, like no, if you, if, I'm talking like 27. You, I think you're really giving yourself too much credit that you make all the best decisions in life. No, I'm like, saying that I'm saying that for this character, I feel like the decisions he's making are things that he himself in, in his journey with her. After how, how many, how long actually does time pass in this movie? I think I, over I, the course of a year and a half or so. I have no idea. Like they're they don't there's no I know they go a lot of places together. I know there's a lot of stuff that transpires in between each scene, but I don't have an actual time correlation towards this. But if it's over the course of a year, then it's even more I feel like the problem is is that the more he's with her, the more flawed he becomes, the more he starts to become 100%. in his own way. Crazy. But I don't think that's a that's a flaw in the storytelling. It's the intention. Like it, th- what I'm saying is there's I know, a no, yeah, that wait, happens. I don't think, I don't, I'm not disagreed that that's not the intention. Then why, what are you arguing in the first place? My whole comment was on the fact that in the beginning, there's an argument that they played it up for the sake of laughs, and it was like trying to not acknowledge it. But I think what, it, because, and like I said before, I feel like we're with the characters in these moments. These aren't things that you can reflect on and only become revelatory in hindsight or as the journey goes on with these characters where you can attach this behavior to something that's habitual and maybe attached to psychosis. I, but but I, I don't agree with the criticism, not from you, but for other people that they, they were the, the director was unaware of what they were doing at the beginning with that scene. I don't think they were trying to show something. It, it's very much like a moment in fight club where you, you don't know why they do something that's, but in hindsight, you can watch it and understand what they were actually showing. But see, like they the, were showing okay, us that's, a hint that what's to come. Originally, I, originally, what you pointed out was was about the beginning where she's throwing stuff out, and I'm saying like that. It like even being a younger person, that should be like a really big hey. She's destructive, uh, it, and when you're comparing it to the jovial nature of some of these other scenes. It would be fine if they weren't his over the top. If you, and that's where I again I draw the confliction with. The, no, with but the are cops. you talking about with like what they're experiencing together? I'm talking about comparing that scene and how it has almost a comedic like undertone when you first watch it yeah, in the very it, beginning. And that's the thing; it's like it conflicts. If they just had those moments, it would add to the experience. But because you have all these really absurd moments, like with a mattress and a guy with a hook uh, tearing it apart, because it. It took his hand years ago. It's it to me. It belittles those experiences. I I disagree because I think they're separate from each other. I I think this is specifically like he's just going on like ignoring it, and the humor is derived from not him saying anything about it, but just the commentary that the guy that he's painting the house is what's making the humor. It's not him trying to play it down downplay it at all. Like, from, from the character's perspective, it's like, we're with him. Like, yeah, it's fucking stupid and crazy. I'm just going to keep working, and hopefully it'll fix itself. I will say, um, I actually, and I don't know if people are going to, if people dislike this scene, 
I actually thought the seeds with their uh, are their neighbors, the one that tries to get him to um, have an affair with her. Yeah, that's their neighbors. Uh, I couldn't tell if they were neighbors or if they were like across the street. It was it was really weird because you can't I can't really see like where the, they are. The geometry of the world is kind of confusing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> I liked seeing the comparison of their relationship and how that's a quote unquote like more normal relationship, and it seems so unhappy. Oh yeah, like I love that part. Like, I thought I, that, that was great. Yeah, I, especially at the end where it's like, because, because that is the comparison where he's so he is so happy with her regardless of how crazy she is or how much, you know, he's willing to sacrifice to make this crazy relationship work. The comparison is he still would rather have that than this weird bickering where these two people who don't care or love each other anymore are just based are just facing each other and just going with emotions. Yeah. It, it's, I think there's so many things you can reflect on moments like that. And it, especially these moments of quiet that allow you to sit with his, the feelings. Like I, I just would love to be able to make a movie like this really where, where you you allow yourself to be in those emotions and, and just sit with them no matter how uncomfortable they, they might be sometimes. But that, that specifically, like you can look at that and say that, it's in his thoughts as he's kind of like crying and smiling at the same time, like, fuck, like I had something that was so much better than this. And like, maybe that's what I'm doomed to because I, I've lost this. It's gone now. It, like you, you can just think so many feelings that he might be thinking at the time. And, and I really appreciate that. Mm hmm. Dead up. <laughs> I do. That's something I like about this movie. What, what I love is like, finally, that like, I'm not a criterion doesn't support us in any way, even though they should. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th when this finally was being re-released i was so i was instantly like f i'm getting that like i because it's really really difficult to find a physical copy of the director's cut you could only get it on dvd and there's only like one version of it every other more current release is the theatrical version which i i've never watched and i really have no desire to have you ever watched uh the, the director's other movie, Diva? Um, I've seen Moon in the Gutter, which is visually fucking incredible. Moon in the Gutter has a lot of fantastic moments. Um, very similar to this. For, uh, actually, the, his experience with that movie led him to making this, where it was uh, unfortunately didn't, wasn't very successful, and also a lot of it got cut down in a way that he wasn't happy with which he, I think he says isn't the reason why it didn't succeed, but he, he's just not happy with the, the cut. And, and I've always wanted and hoped that someday he would be able to release the version of that movie that he intended um, mm. because there's, there's a lot that I really like about that movie. Also a very fucking difficult movie to find. It sucks that it's so <laughs> difficult to find. But uh, that led him to making this and, and wanting to try to do something slightly different and, and i think if you kind of compare it to some of his other works th there's always this absurdity that like i know you don't like that's attached to them all like e even the one that yeah. i was talking about mortal transfer it's a very dark comedy of anything and, and i actually there's moments in that movie that i really like yeah like like i said it's it's my my thoughts my closing thoughts on this movie is that it's still it's it's a it's a good movie, but it's not for you. It's that well, I mean, the personal part of me is like, hey, this this movie makes me. Feel, that's what sucks is like the thing that affects me most about this movie is there is the personal journey I've been through, the comparison to theirs, which makes me want to like say it's good because they they do have a good depiction of that, but these absurd moments in it take me so far out of it that I I cannot recommend this movie like at least not the director's cut but if they cut those moments out and you said the director's cut they do they have I, less I I haven't seen it but just based off of the conversations I've heard of Ben X where he's saying that like they they cut out some of those moments I think they cut out the moment with the olive salesman they cut out the moment with the robbery I believe I I think they cut out the moment where like I, once again, like you're cutting an entire hour out of the movie, so you you yeah. got a lot to cut. Uh, again, I, um, I 
I, and I think it's all those moments that I, I actually like. Not not specifically with regards to the humor, but I love sitting there in this development of this relationship with Zorg. It, 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 that's what makes me feel like it, more uh, empathic to the experience, but also more immersed in it. And, and that's what I say. You can't have a three-hour movie these days that's just about a relationship that falls apart. Uh, I, and I would say that with the, if you took those moments out, I would say, yeah, check this movie out. But with it, it's a, it's a three-hour journey, and I just I can't recommend it. If I watch this movie again, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch the director's the not the director's cut version of it just to see if it sits better for me. But for what this is, I, I as a movie going experience, I can't recommend it. The, the, I don't even know what we talked about the the original title of this movie is Thirty Seven Degrees in the Morning. Which the the for those who like I was curious about this for years, I didn't know what it was, but it it's I think a French saying that uh, or or some kind of French idiom where that's the perfect temperature for ovulation, and, and then the English title was turned to Betty Blue, which also appropriate. Yeah, I think it's perfect. Um, but yeah, this is this is a roller coaster ride of a relationship that's doomed to fail, and I think the movie does capture that. And again, it's um I would say that if eBay wants to, you know, share their opinions, check the movie out, let us know which you know, which one of us you can side more with or any other additions you would like to comment on. Yeah, you can be Team Joey or Team Dickhead. <laughs> team Dickhead's fun. But uh, uh, <laughs> I do wanna just I just wanna make sure I'm not like omitting anything, you know? I don't think you are. I think you I think you nailed everything pretty th- pretty well. There, there's just uh, I feel like this was made at the peak of romanticism in filmmaking. I mean, with the idea of filmmaking itself, from the filmmaker's perspective and also the the performers. Because I see performers who can encapsulate this experience with passion and sincerity in the approach to the material where they they feel like they were the characters. It it could also be because these two people were actually somewhat in a relationship at the times and it just allowed this intimacy and passion to pour through their performance but i it was completely absent of cynicism and the ability to allow the absurd to represent something that isn't a meta or a commentary on itself but to be a part of the experience is both genuine and fucking refreshing i feel like a modern filmmaker's approach to this material would have moments like where the young officer jumps out of the car with his gun pointed at them to be done with a wink and a smile to the audience when here it's intended to just be an absurdity in the world they're experiencing just like how in real life we have countless moments that are stranger than fiction. But that scene in particular, it's not a joke at the material's expense. And whatever humor that's derived from it doesn't, or at least shouldn't be intended to, detract from the drama or the reality of the scenario. At least to me, that is. And that could just be because my approach in digesting this material, or my personal experiences. This leads me to this idea, though, that postmodern thought is why movies like this cannot be made today, and that's sad, because you, you have to let yourself go and be vulnerable with these experiences that may not instinctively agree with you or your own individual logic. So in moments like a scene, like the one we just described, we, we have our guard up, which holds us back from diving into the absurd and, and into these worlds. This is weird, but an example of this is how I used to feel about science fiction shows, like uh, The Next Generation. Back then, it all, it all seemed so stupid, to put it bluntly, and completely opposite of what I found logical and therefore a useless experience. It, so I never allowed myself in those worlds. But the reality is I didn't want to let my guard down. And for the sake of sticking to the same idea, let something absurd entertain me. Or you could say change me or redefine my taste was the fear based off of how I saw myself. And this is not to say that I'm anti-postmodern sentiment, but without the awareness of the potential deconstructive qualities it can hold, it has great potential for preventing us from trying new things. Abstract, new, or against our initial sensibilities even. Because that requires vulnerability. And what I believe is postmodern thinking has co-opted public opinion to justify cynicism for the sake of self-defense, but it only holds us back from experiences we may otherwise enjoy. And it's okay to hate this movie or dislike it. I'm not saying that it's your way of thinking that's wrong and why you don't like this movie or anybody. But I do believe that in order to really appreciate what the artist was intending with this film, you have to let go of cynicism. Even with a movie that goes into dark places like this, 
You don't leave the proverbial theater feeling dread. It's not the end of melancholia. <laughs> You're not emptied by the poor decisions that the hero makes, if you want to call him the hero, or the ultimate loss that happens. Because you let, if you let yourself in the journey, you can leave it knowing what love is, what, what the stranger than fiction moments that can happen in life can make you feel. You can look back on the absurdity of it and, and find humor, even knowing it all can lead to tragedy and what that means to you. What do you do for love? And how do you act when it's taken from you? These are all things that you can allow yourself to feel if you approach this with sincerity and absent of cynicism. And I think that's what the filmmakers did and I think it's what the performers did. And I mean, arguably we have a selfish character that did a horrible thing in this quote unquote mercy killing. But if you approach the material with the sincerity required to appreciate it, I believe, then you let this journey become your own. And that's not necessarily unique to Betty Blue, but it's what makes this a powerful experience for me. It's what a great storyteller was able to do during the 1980s. And I, I don't think you can get away with it today. But I do say that I hope that I can make a movie that has romantic qualities like this, where you can allow yourself to do something this dreamy, unique, abstract, but also just with this kind of presentation. You can make a three hour movie about a relationship that doesn't have the, the tropes and nods and winks. It, it can just be sincere. Yeah. Well, um, that was Betty Blue. You've got both of our opinions. Uh, we're going to break up after this episode because Joey will hate me now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for uh, tuning in with us. Uh, tune in next week while we cover... Um, what are we covering? Uh... <laughs> Uh, well, well, guess we'll find out then. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. Outside the show, you can find Jason on Twitter and Instagram at Insufferable Know It All. You can find Joey on Instagram and Twitch at Kitty Cat Fay. And you can find us and support us on patreon.com backslash IKIA.